I was blessed by God, though at the time I doubt I recognized it as a young person, to be reared in a congregation where the preachers that were there were sounding the faith and preached the old Jerusalem gospel, the whole counsel of God, and did some great teaching when it came down to what New Testament Christianity actually is and what it is not. And I, the longer I, I live, the more thankful that I am and appreciate those things more as the years have gone by than I did then. Those things helped me in so many ways that I continue to benefit from. But it was because those preachers knew what gospel preaching was. And they knew the very purpose of the proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Remembering that it is God's power to save us from our sins. Romans 1 and verse 16. When the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and it declares plainly in Romans 6.23 that the wages, the payment of sin is death, separation from God. Then it tells us that man is the offending party. We have offended God. God. God did not create this world in a fallen state. That is, where people, when they came into the world, were sinners and they had no choice. And he sits in heaven just simply saying, I want somebody to put into hell, so I'll make a bunch of folks that I'll put into hell, because that's just the way I am. That's not God. It may be somebody's concept of a God, but it's not the God revealed in the Bible. And even in his general revelation in nature. We have to realize about life in the flesh, and it would do us all good to understand this, that we're just in, in the training area for eternity. From the time that I first read of the prophet referring to eternity, as our long home. Automatically that means that I know in the flesh on this earth I'm in my short home. <laughs> I'm in a brief state. And James tells us that life in the flesh appeareth just for a little while. It's like a vapor and then it's gone. I think that for a great many of us, if not all of us, but for those of us who are members of the church, that we would do better in our service to God if we would quit trying to find heaven on earth. If we wouldn't try to make life in the flesh the end of all things. It's just such a transitory state. The Bible constantly says things to get us to understand that. Speaking on our level of understanding as maybe an adult or a mother or daddy as an adult would speak to children about things they can't grasp as well as they will someday if they mature in their growth. And we need to understand that because it will help us face what life has to offer. I've often said in funerals, and I'll continue to say it, that life's a schoolroom. God is our teacher. The Bible is the textbook. And the devil supplies the test. Now we understand that, uh, that type of description when it comes to any kind of educational institution. There are rules to go by. If you're in a certain class to study a certain subject, then if the teacher is really what a teacher ought to be, then they're going to set out certain things that you need to know to complete that course. And they're going to give you tests. They're going to really test you. Do you know the material? And you know, it's just not the teacher's fault if the teacher has done his or her job if the student fails the test. And then the consequences follow. Part of the problem in our nation is that we're lowering the standards and we're not emphasizing and consistently with regularity carrying out the consequences to follow people when they violate the standards. I remember a preacher who taught for a good number of years telling about a student 
who came complaining about the F that he received on his report card. And the student said, why did I receive this F? And the teacher looked up from the desk at the student and replied his question. Because there was no lower grade I could give you. Now I say again, if the teacher has done his or her job in imparting knowledge, in carrying the course through, and being concerned about their work as a teacher, imparting that knowledge that's necessary for that course and the subject matter, then if the student flunks, are you going to get all upset at the teacher if you're honest? Now, I know we got bad teachers. That's not the point. I'm saying again, I qualified it. The teacher's done the job a teacher should do and lives up to the term teacher. Then who else has a responsibility in that course to make the grade? If the teacher's doing what the teacher's supposed to do, I say again, for emphasis sake, then it's the student. Well, here's a great classroom of life in the flesh. You know, students always look forward to graduation. I wish I could get some of the members of the church to look toward the time of their departure into glory in the same way students do when they graduate from high school. But we still keep trying to find the ultimate and the final reward here. Bible nowhere teaches that. Does all it can to teach otherwise. But it says on the basis of the way you live here determines your place in eternity. But let me back up again and say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God made us free moral agents. Thus, we have choice. Well, it would be foolish to have the ability to choose, but we never exercise it because there's nothing to exercise it over. I have to choose God and godly things or choose the devil and devilish things. So to have the power of choice or free will automatically implies that I have something to choose between. At least two things. In the case of salvation, in case of heaven, in case of using this, this life and the flesh on this earth as we ought to, it's between God and all that pertains to God and Satan and all that pertains to him. With that in mind, thinking of what you know already, assuming you know something of the Bible's teaching concerning preaching the gospel, knowing that the Lord has commissioned the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, then that gets pretty serious. And it means that there has to be a purpose, a purpose behind preaching. And that's the question I ask you today. Do you know what the purpose of preaching the gospel is? Someone said the prophets of old did their work as God warned them to when they afflicted the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Understanding that those that were comforted, comforted as afflicted people were those who were afflicted because of their love of God. And the sacrifices they made and the persecution that came their way because of their faith in and love of God and their obedience. Well, the design of preaching is to save souls. I can't think of any other thing when I think of what the Bible teaches that gospel preaching is to accomplish. It's to save souls from sin. And by living according to the truths of what it is to be a Christian to get one into heaven. That's all. If my preaching or any other preacher's preaching does anything else, miss the boat. So I need to ask myself the question, because every member of the church should be a teacher of truth. And whatever the case is, wherever you teach, you're going to teach the gospel if you're interested in saving souls. One-on-one -on -one or in your home as the head of your home as a father or the mother teaching children. You're still teaching the truth that sets men free from sin ultimately, finally, completely. When you look at the sermons of the Bible, we can spend a lot of time with, with Jesus' teaching, and we have so many sermons based upon what he did one-on-one -on -one or one-on-a-few, -on -one but then we have those sermons like Joshua's farewell address in Joshua 24. You have sermons such as, of course, the Sermon on the Mount by our Lord in Matthew 5 through 7. 
You'll remember also, especially in the act class on Sunday morning of Stephen's great sermon covering the history of the nation and then bringing it down to pointing out that the people he was speaking to were sinners and needed to repent and turn to God, Acts 7, I say. Then there's Paul speaking to folks who didn't even believe in God in Athens in sermon on Mars Hill, Acts 17. So there are a lot of sermons, and we could go on and list a lot of others. But every one of those was designed to get people to see their lost condition and turn back to God. Now, what does it mean to turn back to God? To quit doing things contrary to God's will and start doing things in harmony with His will. That's what it's all about. You understand? Generally, that's exactly what every sermon in preaching the gospel, preaching the word, being instant in season, out of season, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine, that's exactly what they're designed to do. Turn away from a purposed, habitual life of sin or whatever it is that you're doing that transgresses God's will, and then do His will. That's exactly what it's all about. And sermons don't accomplish that. And there's something wrong with the sermon and, of course, the one who prepared it and delivered it. That's what I mean when I said in the beginning I was very blessed by God as a child to be pointed out that it's man that's in the lost condition and needs reconciliation to God. It's man that was put on this earth and, frankly, made a mess of it and really deserves eternal damnation. And it's God in His infinite mercy who continues to allow time to go on to extend a man the opportunity through belief and obedience to the gospel to be saved. And those who are saved as the church of the living God are expected to have the same disposition toward the lost as God does and preach that gospel and be the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, and the life of every member of the church in their daily living as examples of godliness and in the proclamation and defense of the gospel. But for a while, turn with me to Peter's sermon on Pentecost, the first Pentecost, the Jewish feast day, in Jerusalem. And here's the first recorded gospel sermon. After the authority of Christ in the New Testament was the authority for all men concerning salvation. It is in many ways a model. It's not the only model, but certainly it is a pattern of model to go by in preaching the gospel. You'll remember, as I said a moment ago, that Pentecost is or was, one of the great uh, Jewish feast days out of three under the Mosaic Dispensation, the others being uh, Passover and then the annual Day of Atonement. These were the three feasts in which the law of Moses said all men are come to Jerusalem every year to participate in it. Passover was always on the first day of the week. Of course, the first day of the week was when our Lord was resurrected. And we must remember that following Passover that that happened, I should say. Now on this Pentecost, Christ was crowned king. That's the first day of the week, following the Passover, to say it accurately. He is declared by all of the apostles, we have Peter's recorded sermon, as sitting at the right hand of God and ruling. He was crowned king, as it were, on that day, and his kingdom began on earth and he rules over it through his last will and testament, what he teaches in the New Testament of the Bible. When you look at Peter's audience on that day, you see that they are described as devout men from every nation under heaven. They're there, according to the law of Moses, to worship under that authority. Well, here is a select audience of people, we would say, who are honest, who are upright men, devoted religious people who are concerned about doing things as they know it to serve God. And they're gathered out of every nation under heaven in that whole part of the world, as it were. And they're there to attend this feast to obey God, Acts 2, verses 6 through 13. This covers, in modern day geography, this covers uh, all the way from what is known over there as the Caspian Sea down to what we've heard of so much in the last 20 years, the Persian Gulf, and the areas of the Tigris, Euphrates, the Mesopotamian Valley, from the Sinai Peninsula down to the continent of Africa, wherever there were faithful Jews, Libya, Cyrene, and far west to Italy and Rome, they came in belief and obedience to the will of heaven as they understood it under the law of Moses. 
This in itself says a great deal that God would begin the church or the kingdom of heaven on that day in that way. Dealing with people who had a background and understanding of the Old Testament scriptures that were moving them ever forward to the day, this day, that the church would begin. And using this sermon that Peter gives us, or Luke provides for us by inspiration as a model, then let's look at this preaching a little bit, keeping in mind the question, what is the purpose of gospel preaching? In other words, when you sit down to hear a sermon, and, the, and like that teacher I mentioned a while ago, the preacher's doing what he ought to do, and the way he ought to do it, for the reason he ought to do it, then what can you do on your part? What do you expect when you hear a sermon? First of all, you'll notice from Acts 2, 14 through 16, if you want to open your Bibles to Acts 2 and sort of follow that, uh, you will see that it was to explain the Scriptures. That's a novel idea in some preaching today, that a sermon would actually <laughs> explain the Scriptures. What do they mean? How do we apply this to our lives? What do they cause us to be able to see? This sounds so simple, yet... It's often overlooked by those who claim to be preachers. One, uh, 11 out of, I believe 11, out of 25 verses of this particular sermon came from the Old Testament. You would expect that because there is no New Testament at this time written down to preach from. So to prove Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, then of course they would use the prophecies of the Old Testament. They would call attention to the life of the Christ. And they would talk about all such things thoroughly and work miracles to prove that what they said was from God and not from man, thereby confirming the word. You know, some people have the idea, and I'm not saying you can't learn the scriptures, but you are if you write and divide the word of truth. And you've got to learn how to do that, 2 Timothy 2.15. But just to read the scriptures wouldn't have been enough. This is not to disparage scripture reading. But there's more to preaching the gospel than just to read the Bible. They knew what the verses said. These Jews knew what the Old Testament said. We might well wish that we knew it as well as they did, uh, barring some of their misinterpretations of it. But as far as the text, they knew it. Every sermon in Acts explained the scriptures the people already knew. Now let that sink in. Every sermon you read in the book of Acts of, of Apostles, the New Testament, was explaining the scripture the people already knew. In Stephen's history of the Jewish nation in Acts 7, 19 out of 52 verses were quoted from the Old Testament. How many of us could quote that many from the Old Testament? How many of us quote that many from the whole Bible? Consider the preaching of Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, verse 34. Everything preached brought it down and focused on Jesus. That's why it says it preached to him Jesus. Listen to me. You can begin anywhere in the Bible or whatever word or verse. And when you rightly divide it, which we must understand the truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, it will always lead you to Jesus Christ and the salvation that he alone offers. And thus, when he's reading in Isaiah 53, Philip approaches him. Understandest thou what thou readest? Well, he admitted he needed help and guidance. And so he began at the same scripture after he gives you where he was reading and preached unto him Jesus. Well, do you think he just stood there and said Jesus over and over again? Or did he show how that passage pointed to Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world? And showed what one must do in order to be saved from sin. Well, that means if he showed that, he had to show that all were under sin. That means he had to show that the law of Moses wasn't sufficient in and of itself to forgive sins. Because you see the result in the obedience of that Ethiopian. He had to preach this plan of salvation or the man never could have said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Somehow that got into preaching Jesus. Well, when we look at the Great Commission... Where Jesus himself said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Do you think Philip got around to that? I think he very definitely did. Was there urgency on the part of the eunuch once he had understood the truth of the gospel and how to be saved? Indeed there was. 
For when they came to a certain water, the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, that's a strange thing to say when you don't have to be baptized be saved. Especially in a desert. So you can see what all's involved in preaching Jesus. Jesus just stands as a grammarians call it, and some of you are very familiar with this, a synecdoche where a part stands for the whole thing or whole for the part. Jesus, to preach Jesus, was to preach the gospel. And all that was necessary to do that. Now why all of that? Because man's lost. Man's left God. Man did it. Man made bad choices. He chose to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And thereby separated himself from God. Have you ever been disappointed by somebody. And you knew you were right. And you knew they were wrong. I think all people have. Unless you're oblivious to everything around you. <laughs> How do you deal with it? You know, sometimes we say what they need is a good crack right across the head. But we don't do it in most cases. Some do. But they suffer the consequences too, usually. Well, what do we say? We're offended at somebody doing a wrong when it impacted us. Or leaving undone something they should have done that should have helped us. Well, who's at fault? The person who did the wrong? Or the standard giver? Remember our teacher? When the teacher is doing what the teacher ought to do and the student does not do what is demanded of the class, whose fault is it? Well, life's classroom. We're humans on this earth telling God by our lives, I want to go to heaven more than anything else. I want to love you and please you. Or we're saying, I don't care, it's a bunch of malarkey, I'll do as I please. One way or the other, to one extent or the other, that's where you are. And all men are. So really, who is it that should feel exceedingly offended? The person who's guilty of the violation for sins, the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Or the one who was offended, though he had never done anything but right and good for the person. Well, I know when I'm offended. And that's when I've tried to do something right and to help somebody and get it thrown right back in your face. Have you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one particular person who was dealt with that way? <laughs> Would his name be Jesus Christ of Nazareth? If ever there was a person that walked this earth who should have been offended at the whole race of mankind, it was one of the Godhead three who tabernacled in the flesh. Because he went about doing good he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. He came to earth to show that there is a love of God beyond the man, mortal mind to understand. The best way I can show it is demonstrate it. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And all the things the New Testament says and even back to the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah that he would suffer and undergo because God so loved man. Yes, we're sinners as far as the world is concerned. Why did you obey the gospel if you're a Christian? Let me ask that. Now, you wouldn't want anybody knowing you obeyed the gospel that you were being baptized for the remission of sins, would you? Because that would admit you've loused up somewhere down the road and you just don't louse up. Well, I don't know about you, but as a 12-year-old boy, I had enough right then. I sure you hadn't committed enough sins and lots of them like a lot of folks do. But I knew I'd transgressed God's law. I want forgiveness. Did you want forgiveness when you responded to the invitation of Jesus Christ? Did you want to please God? Did you know that your offenses, your transgression of His will, sins of commission or omission... Had separated and come between you and your God? Were you thankful that God says, fine, but here is a way for you to be reconciled to me? He's the one we've offended. So when people get themselves in a horrendous situation, not God's fault. It's our fault we made the wrong decision. Just like the child in class who knows the assignments, the teacher's doing a good job, but will not do what is in the class. And yet, why did you give me this elf? <laughs> well, you deserved it. <laughs> it's just that simple. You failed. 
You had the choice. You didn't do it. You left it undone. And that was the requirements of the class. You know, we live in a world that doesn't like requirements. You ever notice that? You're required to do this or else. And yet, that's life. You go into the army, any requirements? You go to work for somebody, any requirements? You marry, any requirements? Is there, are there standards of conduct for all those things? Can you tell me, even if people may violate them and ignore them, you tell me something where uh, one does not have standards of conduct, maybe the wrong standard, but a standard of conduct. Men know, even those who deny the existence of God, that you can't get through life worth anything without some kind of standards. So there's built within us the need for a standard of conduct. You can't expect dead rocks and dirt over multiplied billions of years of evolution to evolve to a point to where we have standards. I imagine that. But that's what we're being asked to think of. So the very fact that men knows there must be an objective standard of conduct in everything, some way or the other, really testifies to the soul within us that's made in the image of God that says a thing ought to be a certain way or it ought not be a certain way, and I've never seen a rock feel that way. It couldn't. There's no way that dead rocks and dirt, matter in motion, could arrive at a state of some higher form of matter in motion and have the wherewithal to say, we need a standard. Unless you're of the persuasion that says, we're going to make ourselves into pea gravel and we're going to make ourselves into some other kind and so we'll have a standard of knowing what kind of rocks ought to be used. Isn't that silly? But that's what we're asked to believe, by implication at least. So we explain the scriptures, and in the explanation of those scriptures, we learn of the lost case of man, and man put himself in all of that. How did the Bible picture the world beginning? In a mess or in a state of perfection? And then ask yourself the question, who messed it up? Was it God? No. Remember when David transported the ark contrary to the way the law of Moses authorized to be transported? They hadn't studied. They didn't think about it. But when Uzzah touched that ark contrary to the law of Moses, he died. David was upset. Mad because the man died. No indication on Uzzah's part. He did any more than try to steady an ox cart that he thought was going to fall over and the ark fall off of it. But he died. Now who was at fault? It was David and the priest and Uzzah. Well, why? Because years and years and years before, the law of Moses said, only of the tribe of Levi shall certain families transport that ark and transport it in a given certain way. So whose fault was it that Uzzah died? God? Why is that in the Bible? If not to teach us the very point I'm making this morning. We need to hold the scriptures then up to the light. And if you go back to the days when Israel was restored to its place, or Judah was, after the Babylonian captivity of 70 years, Ezra is teaching the law. And if you look in Nehemiah 8, verses 5 through 8, they didn't just read the scripture and say, you got it, go on. Cause them to understand the sense of it. In other words, what it meant you do and don't do. And that's the way preaching ought to be. We hold up the scriptures as the light of the world. Look at Peter's sermon again. There's no appeal made to current events or modern theological thought. It's simply to the scriptures and the right division of them and what they mean. And he calls them to understand what it means. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all the way through uh, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2. Paul's telling Timothy, here's how it's done. Here's how it's done. In John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, the truth about what? A truth about anything that has to do with salvation. And that gets down to showing people what you ought to do and ought not do and when you ought to do it and how you ought to do it and so on. It's not just reading the scriptures. It's like this. Can you find your address and social security number in the Bible saying God wrote this for you? You can't do it. How do you know that it applies to you? Because of certain scriptures implying it, such as 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. The things that thou hast learned of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now that continues then 
the Bible right on down to the end of time that it's for you and for me. Although my name's not in it explicitly. In 2 Peter 1, 3, And His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Him who called you to glory and virtue. That's the way preaching ought to be. That ought to be emphasized. Jude 1, if you want to call it that, one chapter book of Jude, verse 3, Beloved, while I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. That's the system of salvation that is the New Testament system. To contend earnestly for it, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And the psalmist said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Psalm 119, 105. It's only that when you can see that this is what this scripture says and then what it means to you to believe and do. You can't come back to God. You can't find salvation till you understand it that way. So the only way to know the mind of God is to study and understand the scriptures. Paul gives a great deal of time to that in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 13. Paul penned the scriptures so when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3 and verse 4. Now, the last point I want to end on, because it's where it ought to end, is that preaching, and by this is where I said you preach my sermon, preaching is designed to disturb people. Preaching is designed, if it's scriptural preaching, to disturb people. We might say to bother people. We might even say to upset people. It's amazing to me that people want sermons in certain places that well, it just doesn't bother me at all. Well, that's a poor preacher. Acts 2, 22 through 24 bothered a lot of people. But these are devout men. They're doing the best they can from honest hearts to do what God required of them in the law of Moses. So why did Peter say that? Because the law of Moses is insufficient. And they hadn't recognized Christ as, in general as the Son of God. And Peter says, you have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. And the Bible says, having proved these things, this truth pricked those devout men in the heart. It was the truth that did the pricking. But it had to be preached right. It had to be applied. It was like Nathan appearing before David and he gave out this wonderful story and it upset David. But until Nathan said, Thou art the man, he had made the application, actual application to his sins with Bathsheba and what he did. And that's what it takes. Pricking one to the heart is not a task to be relished. But we do look for the end result of freedom from sin and salvation. And there will not be freedom of sin and salvation if the heart's not pricked as it's described in Acts chapter 2. Between sin and salvation is a painful period of self-examination. A la Brother Roth. <laughs> it is. It's meant to be. Have you ever wondered why the Lord allowed Saul of Tarsus to be three days and three nights blind and fasting before the truth regarding remission of sins came to him? Can you imagine what was running through that man's mind when in all honesty and sincerity he had persecuted the church thinking that Christ was a false Messiah and then, wham, I'm wrong. You ever realize people have to come to the conclusion, I'm wrong. It's my fault. I've sinned. I did it. Nobody else did it. I'm in the mess I'm in. Why? Because I put myself there. How? I chose to go contrary to God's will. If you can ever get people to receive the gospel in that way in your attempts to convert them by teaching them the truth, you're going to accomplish something. And everybody that's truly obeyed the gospel, and I call your life, if you're a faithful Christian, uh, to the time you obeyed the gospel, simply to record, that's exactly what happened to you, or you're not converted yet. Men must come to the shocking realization they're lost and it's their own fault and God did not do it. Some preachers, I think, are so diplomatic in their preaching that they could even make a sinner, couldn't even make a sinner know what to do, ask the question what to do. They just couldn't do it. In fact, they're working hard not to do it because they're afraid somebody say, you're judgmental. Listen, folks, there is a godly judgment that if you do not do, you will lose your soul, John 7, verse 24. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, you're to do that every day, beginning with your own life, your family, and everybody else. That's as much a part of the Bible as any other part of the Bible. 
And you will never become a Christian unless you judge your own life from a righteous perspective. What makes a person obey the gospel? They know they're saved. No, they know they're lost. They don't want to go to hell. And they learn to appreciate the love of God. Because you begin to say, why does he put up with a mess like us for thousands of years? And why does he continue to do it? Look at the world around about you. Look at how you get upset at the world around about you. Would you if you had the complete power and wisdom to handle this world like God, but you had the disposition you've got now, how long would you put up with it? Well, let me top it off with this one. Real close. Tacking this on here, think of Jesus Christ. Why, if, he, he, if you're attached to him, what goes along with children sometimes, to understand what could have been, Father, why must I go down there and become one of them? I didn't make this mess. I know as the executor of the Godhead 3, I put into the practice the plan to make earth. But I didn't do this. Now, I'm speaking as a man. That's not the way God thinks. Why have I got to go become one of them and give up my glory and live as a man and be treated terrible, though I'm, I'll live a sinless life? I'll never do anything but good as the Bible defines good. And you want me to go down there and mess around with that crowd? Look, wipe them off the earth. Let's start over. Do you remember in God's dealing with Moses that Moses was put to the test because he is a type of Christ. When God told him one time that the sins of Israel stand out of the way, I'll wipe them all out and I'll start over. Do you remember what Moses did? No, please don't. Don't. That was an education for Moses, folks. God did that to cause Moses to understand mercy and long-suffering and the worth of a soul because he was the type of the Christ to come. And so God, quote, backed off, unquote. See, Jesus is our mediator between God and man. Without Jesus, this world will not be here today. He ever lived to make intercession for us. He knows the plight of man. He knows what it is to live on this earth and be tempted and sin. He knows the hurt that's here. You say, well, God knows all things. I thought you said in the beginning. He, he knew that, not experientially. He knew it exactly when it comes to knowing facts. Best way I can describe it. But God didn't live and subject himself to what man undergoes. That took one of the Godhead three to become a man. So if anybody has a right to be upset with anybody, it's God to be upset with man. And as we close on this point, that very point, that's why at the judgment that there's no mercy and there's no grace and there's no invitation, that's all taking place. That's now. Now's the time. Now's the accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. All these thousands of years, I don't know how the future will go. May end before I get through talking. But it's going. Somewhere it's going to end. That's the end of mercy. Now all things are brought into judgment. And if you did not partake of the gospel and live faithful in the great favor of the Almighty, enjoying His mercy, there won't be any extended anybody there. Because you're saved or lost when you get there. And the sentence you'll receive will be dependent upon whether you're saved or lost. But there's no mercy at the judgment. Saved by those who claim that mercy in this life in obedience to the gospel. Look at these sermons, brethren. Understand who has been faulted, who has been sinned against. Understand that. And it's God that stands in his great patience beyond my mind to understand, more better said, long-suffering, and gives us a chance to come back to him. We left him. He never left us. We sinned and brought reproach on him. To atone for that sin, Jesus had to go to the cross. My sins put Jesus on the cross. My sins caused every lick of that whip on his back. 
My sins put that crown of thorns on his head. My sins necessitated him leaving heaven and coming to this earth. My sins made him have to do what was necessary and what's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. My sins. And until you feel that personal about it, you need to just work on yourself. God's defended party, but he's also the one who made the bridge whereby we could come back and stand before him just and complete by the blood of his son. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made. What a thought that is to describe the glory of the second person of the Godhead. In him was life, and life was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light, but he came to bear witness of the light, that is the true light, that lighteth the world. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Listen. Full of grace and truth. Verse 14. Are you subject to the gospel call? Be reconciled to God in humble belief and obedience to the gospel by believing he's the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. If you're subject to his invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.